Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Today it is my unique privilege to welcome a very very senior banker from Vancouver, Canada, Martin Glynn. Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Martin is the former president and CEO of the HSBC Bank in USA and Canada. He is the chairman of the Public Sector Investment Board. He is on the board of Husky Energy, also on the board of Sun Life Financial, and he is a corporate director. So, Martin, what would you say are three key milestones in your life or your career? Well, that's a that's a tough question. Uh, I think I, I would put it in three categories. So, mm-hmm. more categories and milestones. The the um, my par- I'm an only child. My parents immigrated to Canada from the UK after mm-hmm. the war, which was very very common. There was a you know a wave of uh, those kinds of immigrants. I'm th- I'm glad they picked Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, Canada is full of immigrants, and they presumably had some choice where they went. Um, thank goodness my parents chose uh, Canada, and I was born and raised in Montreal. So my upbringing, my family background, they're, um, they're both uh, university graduates, uh, and so they pushed me into lots of education, private school, and I ended up getting an MBA from UBC, mm-hmm. uh, the University of British Columbia. So, yeah. so that was uh, milestone number one, was just growing up. And being supported with a strong family and a pressure to um, get as good an education as possible. Mm-hmm. So the second one would be the whole my whole work career, which, which um, again I consider myself very lucky. I worked for HSBC from 1982 to 2006. Mm-hmm. Which, if you look at the economic cycles and the you know you know um, absence of wars and uh, huge pandemics. Mm-hmm. It was a very uh, positive experience. Uh, it, Canada was a good place to be in those days. It still is. Vancouver, where I ended up because the headquarters of HSBC was in Vancouver, was just a growth um, environment full of international people. I sort of thrived in HSBC, thrived in that environment being international and with Iranians and Ishmaelis and Indians and Chinese and Many other uh, ethnic groups, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. I was the the icing on the cake was to go to New York for three and a half years to run basically North American banking. And uh, 2003 to 2006 was a was a good time. And I had no idea when I retired that a year later the world would come to a screeching halt. Yes, and uh, so that was that was that. And I um, and then I guess. Part of that career aspect was I then I morphed into board work, which I found very interesting. And I guess I had the credentials to be asked. And um, we can talk a little about that later. Mm-hmm. And the third thing is a sort of a personal life uh, milestone. I have four kids. I, sadly, I've been married twice, but I uh, have this wonderful partner now. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, the um, achieving some personal uh, satisfaction and happiness and um, and being a father and a partner are great a milestone into itself. So that, those would be my three. Fantastic. How nice these milestones are. So let's talk, Martin, about banking and financial services. I mean, you know, you spent a career in, 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 in this business. You, know, you, you entered banking uh, in 1982, which is around the time when I started working also. I mean, I started a little earlier than you. Banking has changed completely over the last three decades. What are your thoughts? Well, that's an interesting point. Strangely enough, banks, the future of banks was, you know, was viewed with great uh, pessimism. Uh, banks were going to fade away. People were going to write uh, checks on their, their Merrill Lynch money market account, mm-hmm. Google, uh, Amazon, they were all going to take over. Even the um, fintech world was going to make all these dinosaur banks go uh, extinct mm-hmm. but banks have remained strong and uh, th- they've done that for a number of reasons uh, one is they've broadened their breadth mm-hmm. so they are in all areas of finance so they don't really care whether you take a mortgage out or open a checking account or whatever so uh, but they they built relationships and they had brand equity and they had a for some reason banks you think your money's safe how many places in the world do you actually go and hand your money over to somebody you have never right. met before 
and uh, who doesn't get paid well, particularly, and uh, you feel very satisfied at the Correct. end of that experience. So, so uh, banks have changed. Uh, it, compliance is a huge issue. Um, relationship banking has changed dramatically uh, because people you trusted uh, were not necessarily um, people that you have. You should have been dealing with mm -hmm. uh, the the level of um, know your client. Uh, rigmarole to open an account is is just light years different, and also the digital interface is uh, it make, is making a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So, but that reinforces the big and and uh, doesn't necessarily allow the small player to arrive. So, in spite of it all, and and by the way, there are still there's still a role for bricks and mortar, mm -hmm. which is also being viewed over the last twenty years as being. Uh, over, uh, but there's uh, this bricks and clicks, this uh, small footprint, but uh, broad digital platform it seems to be uh, that combination in some form seems to be the key to the future. Very interesting. And you know, you just spoke about the digital uh, transformation that's taking place. My question is, you know, most of these old traditional banks like HSBC or these big uh, state-owned banks, they used to pride themselves on the number of branches they had. Mm -hmm. Is the digital revolution going to change this whole thing where you'll say that I don't need so many branches? Well, it's, it's definitely true. And particularly with 0% uh, interest rates, the, uh, the, the, the profitability of a retail branch has been absolutely hammered by mm. the fact that they're checking account balances. You know, that lazy money Mm -hmm. that uh, that allowed them to give free checking and free right. services, free ATM, you know, ABM, ATM card. Those the, the profitability is being kicked uh, being kicked down by mm -hmm. by virtue of low interest rates. And mm -hmm. so so you're you're right that there's uh, but there's still a role. Where where do you open an account? A lot mm -hmm. of people still open an account where there's a sign near their place of uh, their place of work or their place of residence mm -hmm. and it, it, it sign is called it's like a bill a branch is a really a billboard and uh, they may never go in there again but there is a, a good need for some level of physical presence um, and then the rest of the service can be provided digitally mm. interesting so you know i've had a relationship with uh, hsbc since 1979 when i started working my salary used to go to HSBC, and I remember going to the bank and pulling out cash. But the entire world seems to be moving towards a cashless economy in the future. What are your thoughts uh, on what, where, this, where the developing world and the world is moving towards cashless economy? And what is it going to do to banks? Well, first of all, what do you mean by cash? If you mean actually physical in your physical wallet, notes, physical notes, bills, then I think... Banks don't need that to operate. It, it's a loss leader. They have to store it. They have to, they have to um, dispose of it, send mm -hmm. it back to the central bank, get new bills. So I think the, uh, the idea of digital payments and so on couldn't be better for banks. Mm -hmm. As long as their competitors, their virtual competitors don't emerge and, mm -hmm. and um, somehow um, uh, take their, their business away. But cash itself is not a necessity for banks to make money. Okay. And... Uh, I mean, COVID has now caused us all to, I, I used to still pay for my Starbucks coffee with, mm. you know, $5 or $3 or a few mm. coins. Now I'm using plastic only because I don't want to touch yeah. any bills and so on. So, so I think COVID has advanced the cashless society. I mm. think this helps uh, countries where they don't have a lot of branches and they're very inefficient. But in Canada, we have basically six or seven large banks. They're very efficient. They have thousands of branches and trillions of dollars of assets. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is is less clear what the future is Correct. in a cashless society because they have 7,000 banks. Mm -hmm. And some of them are totally tiny and like one-horse town banks. And I think there's no real future for them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, you know, again, as, as a banker who sits on many, many boards now, what are some of the core values you have believed in yourself as well as for your institution? Well, I think, you know, this is that's an interesting question. Um, you know, honesty, integrity, openness. There's just no room now for 
you know, with fact checks and fake mm -hmm. news. There's not, there's like total, you know, empathy, you know, supporting employees, um, worrying about their mental state. Mm -hmm. I mean, this wasn't something I worried about 20 years ago mm -hmm. was how, how are people feeling? You know, now there's a huge effort made on, um, in terms of core values. Now, now it's, there's ESG that has crept in that is, okay. you know, we're trying to save the planet. You know, it's not just about uh, shareholder value, mm -hmm. multiple stakeholders. We have all the issues around diversity and inclusion that are part of core values for, for companies. And so the, the vision and the purpose is, is now more clear as being articulated by a board. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and there's also, um, uh, less tolerance for for being in the public eye negatively. In mm. other words, if, you, if you're in the Wall Street Journal on the front page, there's something wrong, mm. uh, and I'm the equivalent anywhere in the world. You, the reputational issues around boards and companies are, are never been greater than they are today. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. So you know, uh, Martin, you have you know been CEO of a large bank with probably employed thousands of people. You've sat on boards of large institutions, interacted with CEOs. As you look back, what do you think are some of the key uh, qualities a CEO should have? The, I think the, the, there used to be a role for an autocratic bully, mm. someone who is just strong-willed, sort of sucks the air out of the room and Correct. people just follow and, and I, I think there's some extent that maybe it culturally, there are elements of that still in the world, but in North America, that doesn't fly. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the, the, the leader is, um, is someone who spends a huge amount of time on, on people, on um, providing a vision, having a social contact, whatever that is, in person or virtual with as many people as possible, and being empathetic. Uh, and um, the soft side of leadership is it's not the smartest person in the room anymore. Mm. Uh, and so the, the soft side of leadership, I think, is, is absolutely critical. And uh, But there's still some elements, I mean, when we get away from COVID, of management by walking around, being visible, mm. uh, being articulate, not only internally as a visionary, you know, this is our message, this is what we keep, you know, keep repeating that message. But also outside, what does the company stand for? Mm -hmm. Clients want to be comfortable that the leader of a company they deal with has high integrity, has a desire to help the community. So there, there's a multiplicity of things, but it's more on the soft side. And, and, um, and I guess um, I remember a line, you know, management is motivation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, essentially you have to get other people pulling along with you and you have to motivate them, and and they don't follow easily. I th I would say you'll get to maybe a question later. Yeah, younger people are aren't automatically really. supporting you and following you just because you have a big title. Absolutely right. So let you know. Let's talk a little bit about now the younger generation. You know, this new age belongs to the millennials and the Gen Zs. You know, who, and I have great faith in what they're going to do to this world, and how they'll probably correct a lot of mistakes we made. What are your comments on how the millennials and the Gen Zs are changing financial services? Well, there's, I mean, the, if you, let's take it from a customer point of view and then maybe as an employee, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. somebody in the workforce. So the customers are they're definitely more digitally savvy. They're expecting uh, instant everything, um, accounts that are connected, e ease of business. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have less desire to talk to, to an individual. They can't understand why they need to. So, the, you know, that's pushing the digital delivery. But the, the reality is that as they, I think they will change as they get older. Mm. I think the word, the word advice is undervalued mm. as, a, as a consideration for what financial services companies do. Mm. And I think uh, tailoring one's uh, financial services one gets to the individual mm. is also very important. It can be done partly digitally, but I think there's a role for individual for human contact as well. So I think there, there people will find uh, that to be true. Now, as, as an employee, I think there's there's um, 
I don't think people are necessarily as ambitious mm -hmm. and certainly as tolerant of bureaucracy and of like, I have to take these steps to go forward. Um, uh, and, and the way I did. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think there's a whole, you know, you have to, I mean, they're interviewing you as opposed to you interviewing them. Mm. This is a shock to recruiters. Uh, you know, when the president phones and says, you know, I'm going to give you a, you know, can I have five minutes? Uh, welcome to the company. Mm. And, uh, you know, they're sort of almost indifferent. It's nice to hear from him, but, you know, it's not the respect and the sort of the, 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 um, the valuing of hierarchy the way it used to mm. be. So the, where this will end up is interesting because these young people tend to be left of center. They want to, obviously, we have to clean up our climate. We have to deal with all kinds of things, but we're saddling them with huge debt. And so these poor people also have to, they have to work hard to support families. And guess what? We're saddling them with huge deficits that will translate okay. to debt down the road. And, and I think all of that to say that because of the baby boomers are gone, mm. the, there's fewer employees to, and fewer people. There'll be full employment for mm -hmm. the rest, for the next 25, 30 years. Mm. Canada needs to bring in over 1% of its population a year in immigration mm -hmm. just to survive. So there'll be lots of opportunity, but motivating those people to get ahead and move up in a traditional company uh, is going to be more challenging than I think it was in my generation. Very interesting. So, Martin, let's talk now about, the, you know, let's move to the next segment of our conversation, which is you as an independent director. Uh, you're on the board of several companies. Uh, I know that the in India particularly the 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 responsibility of fiduciary responsibility of a non-executive director is the same as that of an executive director. So my question to you is that before you accept a board position, what do you look for? Well, I mean you can I mean narrowly you want to be make sure it's a strong company that has a good reputation because you uh -huh. wear the reputation of the company immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if it pollutes or it has, you know, employee uh, relation problems or whatever, or, or gets fined. And, and HSBC, actually, after I left, it took its lumps. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was very sad to see that. And when I say, well, I'm a retired hsbc -er, it hurt. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so what I look for is a strong company, obviously, you know, excellent people, People you can rely on. I look at who the board is because you're in a lifeboat. When something goes wrong, you're sitting in a room. You have to solve your problems together. You yeah. have to. You don't have to be friends, but you have to trust each other mm -hmm. because you're in it together. So there's there's a whole bunch of things, but you want to be on a high quality board. There's one of the one of the issues in uh, North America is that in the entrepreneurial space, companies come and go. But, you, you know, from a regulatory point of view, you have to disclose that you've been on a board that's been bankrupt in the last 10 years. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's all kinds of stigmas associated with that. So you're, a board member is biased towards going to a higher quality board mm -hmm. that is less likely to fail. And, and, uh, and you look at the people. I like to look at industries that are found of interest because you can't go on five bank boards. You have okay. to go. You, you have to pick different sectors that don't compete. So mm -hmm. I always enjoy uh, dabbling with industries that I didn't know a huge amount about. Okay. And, you know, one more question uh, for independent directors. Uh, I find it, you know, in many companies, and as I mentioned to you earlier, you know, I used to sit on the board of Gavi, and Gavi has consistently been awarded the most transparent organization in the world. I often wonder what level of transparency do you, as a board member, seek from your board? Well, from the, from management, you expect a very high level of transparency. Correct. I mean, the issue, you know, it's very easy to say, but problems should go up quickly. Good news can take its time coming up the mm. line, but bad news should come up immediately. Mm. And of course, we had this COVID crisis, which none of us expected back in right. March and April. And I was dealing, I mean, I'm a chairman of a very $200 billion pension fund. And mm -hmm. so we were... We were meeting for a while daily and then weekly, and there's a, you know, so clearly challenges, uh, mm. challenges there. But I've got time for two or three questions for you personally. Okay. 
my first question to you is that as you look back i had a very very successful career successful life my question to you is what does success mean to martin uh that's an excellent question i think there's a certain amount of financial security that uh i i feel i have um which is helpful so i don't wake up hungry or thinking of that mm-hmm. um success is the ability to give back and so i have more time to give back to mentor to help people who are in need i mean people of my age are involved in a lot of non-profits and yeah. charities and art gallery boards and things like that so so success is about family uh it's about making sure your kids are healthy and supported mhm finding time for yourself which i didn't have when i so well uh, said in a big corporate very, job very well said my next question to you is that uh, you know you keep doing so many different things you keep giving back so much what or who inspires you i think there are individuals uh that are part of your career path at mm-hmm. uh, that you look up to and you try to copy and so on um i think the inspiration comes from um a variety of sources and i think i i would say my parents who arrived in canada with 500 mm-hmm. dollars uh, inspired me because i felt a a need to succeed and um and i think if one feels that one can dr- contribute one should so i i had this uh, a lot of capacity uh I have this sort of probably a fault of fitting everything in so I take on more than normal people would I think and yeah. uh and so that drives me to uh, to succeed okay and I have time for one more question so I was debating what to ask you but I think I'm you know given the thousands of young people who would listen to your and my conversation my question to you is what would your advice be to a young individual starting off on their journey in the banking world i mean everyone is different and uh, i'm on the assumption that they are ambitious and they would like to bank stroller are in this traditional hierarchy so mm-hmm. if, you, if you join google there's probably one or two layers between the, the ceo and the most junior person but the i would say travel so being worldly mobility mm-hmm. um listening uh one of my key things that I did was I did several jobs that were totally out of the box mm-hmm. so they would come to me martin uh what do you know about wealth management which was a, which is a big deal in banks mm-hmm. and ha- and was a new development about 20 25 years ago mm-hmm. and what do you know about wealth management well actually nothing well you're now in charge of wealth management and you're going to put that in and build trust businesses and brokerage and asset management and so on. So there's so for young people I would say take things on, don't be siloed. So if you're a private banker, don't just be in private banking and hope to mm-hmm. if you want to be CEO, you've got to move from private banking into the operation side, into commercial, into here. And even if you're if it's outside your comfort zone, do it. So mm-hmm. so um you know, work hard and all those kinds of things but, but uh, and the, the other thing is uh, form relationships. Mhm. uh it's very important to uh, broaden your relationships um and um you never know when those can be very handy you need to make mm. a phone call and and uh, don't be uh, a loner okay great advice so those are some idea no this is a great advice martin thank you very much it's been it's been such a pleasure speaking to you i wish you lots of success in everything that you're doing thank you again Well thank you and if you're in Vancouver please come and look me up. Will do. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You video cast and podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.